welcome to Ponderosa Center Presents. I'm Nicole Musgrove. I'm the Development Director for the Ponderosa Center. Uh, we're glad to have you all here today. Our guest and um, person making the presentation is Craig Utter. He is the Executive Director of the Payette Land Trust. And so we'd like to welcome him. Craig, welcome. Uh, tell, us, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what we're here to talk about today. Sounds good. Thanks, Nicole. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And um, from my standpoint, I'd, I'd really like this to be a conversation about the Pale Land Trust and, and conservation in, in and around the West Central Mountains of Idaho. But um, I've got a few slides prepared uh, that we can go through to kind of familiarize everybody with the Land Trust. Uh, but I do hope that towards the end that we have a great uh, opportunity to have a back and forth conversation about what the Payette Land Trust does. Um, again, my, my name's Craig Utter. I've been in McCall now since 2006, but I grew up in a town on the eastern slope of Colorado outside of Denver, uh, up in the mountains, about 7,500 feet, little town called Evergreen. And when I was a kid in the 70s, it was a tourist town. And I got to watch as I grow, grew up the expansion of, of the Denver metro area and the impact it had on our little community. So I, I'm pretty familiar with what it's like to watch um, a mountain town go through the, uh, the growing pains of growing. And uh, I went on to Colorado State University and got a degree in agriculture and beef cattle production and eventually uh, went on and, and bought a ranch um, with some other folks, uh, there were four of us in Nebraska, in the Sand Hills, which is interesting place because it's a wholly privately owned state. So all the states in that uh, area from South Dakota to Texas were part of the Homestead Act. So being a landowner in the state of Nebraska and being somebody that was uh, involved in conservation found a way to work within a state that's privately owned. So if there was a fish and game or uh, a species of concern, all of those folks had to work with private landowners and, and through being involved with the Nebraska cattlemen and, and chairing their um, natural resources and environment committee, both in the state of Nebraska and on the national level, really cut my teeth on partnerships and how to conserve landscapes and, and keeping them productive and working at the same time. And being a mountain kid and, and ending up in the sand hills of Nebraska was a shock in and of itself because there wasn't a tree to be found or a rock. And it was probably one of the most uh, interesting and wild places that I've ever been. Um, I had an opportunity to help a neighbor gather cattle and he said, just meet us, go south from your place and, and meet us where the pens are set up. And I ended up riding through a six section pasture without a fence. So that, um, you know, went about six miles, saw three windmills, and that was it. And it, and I realized that maybe I was out of my league if I thought I was just in, in, the, um, in Nebraska and it wasn't going to be interesting. And that was within the first two months I was there and found it to be a fascinating place. I left Nebraska in um, 2006 because I wanted to come back to the mountains. And my sister was here. And um, she said, you need to come visit McCall. It's a lot like Evergreen and, and Colorado when we were kids. So I came out here and, and thought I would work in the area for one year and then maybe head back to Nebraska or go on. And I ended up fighting fire for the Forest Service. I was stationed out at Warren on an engine because we had fought fire in Nebraska. Uh, we were responsible in our own communities for our own firefighting and I actually had a lot of wildfire out there. Um, so I thought, well, I'll do this for a little bit. And ironically, I was on a fire up at Josephine Lake. The three of us on our engine had hiked all of our gear up to the top of the hill. And we had a big tree that was on fire, needed a specialist to cut it down. And so they called in uh, a sea sawyer and he rappelled out of a helicopter down to the fire. All of his gear came down. He stayed the night, cut the tree down. They needed him somewhere else. So the helicopter came back, picked his gear up. And this guy walked off of the fire with, with like 30 pounds of gear on his back. And we'd spent two days hauling hundreds of pounds of gear up the hill. And I said to myself that I was in, I was on the wrong piece of equipment if I was going to be here in the mountains fighting fire. 
ironically ended up getting hired by the Crassel helicopter crew out on the South Fork and was with that um, helicopter crew for 11 seasons fighting fire for the Forest Service. Really got involved in aviation and it, it gave me an opportunity to see all of the Western US uh, from a helicopter and, and from a fire standpoint. It also helped me get down to Antarctica three times. So I've been to the McMurdo station uh, twice working with fixed wing cargo. So we did all the cargo support in and out of Christchurch into Antarctica and then onto the South Pole. And then my, my third season, I worked with the helicopter program down there and was a glorified taxi service for scientists, which was fantastic. Um, anywhere the scientists wanted to fly, they could put in time and uh, we'd take them to some of the most remote places that you could get a helicopter to. And they would collect rocks and other things and data and whatever they were doing, it was pretty fascinating. Everywhere from tracking um, seals and whales in open water to, to looking uh, for the last remaining piece of life in a, in a small glacier fed lake. Um, so I, I feel really uh, fortunate that I fell into firefighting in McCall because that led to aviation, which led to a lot of other things. Um, but what, what really happened was I found myself looking at 50 and most of the kids coming onto the crew were, were half my age and decided maybe I should do something besides swinging a Pulaski on a fire line. And about that time, the Payet Land Trust was coming out of uh, sort of its hibernation had been an all volunteer group for quite a few years. And uh, Rick Faraday and some other board members were looking for a, a part time executive director. So I, I decided that in 2017, as, as I finished my fire season, I would, I would see what Payette Land Trust had to offer. And so I came on as a contracted executive director part-time. Wasn't sure what, what it was, what, what the viability was. I was familiar with other land trusts and had been involved in conservation for almost 20 years in Nebraska and uh, was really interested to see what the land trust was all about. And it didn't take me long to realize the viability and the need um, for a, not just permanent staff, but for a stronger organization because McCall and West Central Mountains were growing so quickly. So I started in, in November of 17 and, and was the part-time director in, in 18 and 19, and then realized that um, I, was, I was just not part-time, but uh, volunteering easily the other part-time. So we started working on trying to fill my position as a full-time employee, which we did successfully uh, raise enough funding in um, 2020 to be able to do that this year. And then we're looking to try and bring on other people because the need is there. It's just a matter of, of finding the funds. And so that's kind of my background. I'm, I'm, I came up in a small mountain town. I've got a lot of a lot of ag experience and finding ways to make partnerships work and balance is a huge thing for me. How do we balance conservation and development in the areas that we live? And um, uh, so I just sort of fell like this was the area that I wanted to contribute uh, to McCall and, and it's been great. It's been fantastic. We've got a lot going on. That's, uh, that's great. Uh, really, really nice to hear your, your story and how you, uh, how you found McCall. Everyone has a really interesting yeah. story about that. And I, I just think that that's a, a great thing that connects us all. We've, we've all been attracted to this place in some way or another. Um, so tell us a little bit more about Payette Land Trust. What, um, what is it that you're working on over there? Okay. And I'm going to, I'm going to throw a few slides up because I think there's, some, some really good information. Some of you may know a lot about the land trust and others may not. And uh, so I think it's, this is a good opportunity to kind of bring us all up to speed on what a land trust is and who we are. And so um, I'm gonna share a few slides and images here. So the Payette Land Trust has been in the area for 20, over 28 years. And a lot of people don't know that, but uh, we got started in 1993 and have been mainly volunteer. We had an executive director, Bob Voscular, for a little while um, in, I think, 2004 to about 2012. Um, 
but we've we've been here in the community trying to service anybody's desires to conserve their their property. Um, who we are is a, a group of local residents who form the board of directors, and you can see those folks here. You may know some of them, um, you know, just from being around. Uh, but but we've got a really diverse group, anywhere from uh, you know Rick owns May Hardware and is local in town. Um, Mike has been involved in, in quite a few nonprofits and conservation groups. Jim does uh, landscape work or uh, land planning work. Bob Voscular is a past executive director and is in uh, a retired surgeon. Suzanne Rainville was a, a past forest supervisor on the payette her whole career with the forest service. Gary Thompson, um, is a retired corporate CPA, but has a passion for conservation and has worked on different projects across the country. Regan Berkeley is the uh, Idaho Fish and Game Regional Wildlife Biologist. And Ryan Thomason is our newest um, board member. And uh, he comes in from, he's actually a pilot and an aeronautical engineer and has, uh, as he's moved around the country, worked with different communities on conservation and planning. And so we've got a really nice, well-rounded board of directors that bring a lot to the different projects that we work on. Um, what is the Pay a Land Trust? This is a question we get a lot, actually. Um, some people think we're a bank, <laughs> but we're not. We're a nonprofit. We're a 501c3 nonprofit that works mainly to not own and manage land, but to provide an opportunity for landowners to conserve their property with conservation easements. Now that doesn't mean that we don't own some property. We do have some fee title that has been donated to us and we do help people manage it. But our main objective is to provide opportunities for conservation easements. Um, so that's the next question. What is a conservation easement? And actually it's a legal document. It's like any other easement uh, that you might've heard of, uh, access easement, a road easement, a power line easement. They're all based in the legal world and our easements are between a property owner and the land trust. And what we do is we try and tailor that easement which comes with restrictions and use types to whatever that property owner wants to do. So an easement is always different. It's never the same because it's based on a unique piece of property and a unique property owner. And so we have easements with farmers and ranchers that allow for, um, them to continue to do what they are, are, are doing in production. But what we want to do is make sure that we don't see a lot of uh, development happen on that property. And so the, the key part to our easement is a non-development um, restricted use. So what we're trying to do is prevent uh, development in those areas where we feel conservation should remain. And conservation can be conservation of an ag corridor, conservation of a river corridor, a wetland corridor, um, it could be a viewshed corridor. Um, so what we look at is what are the important parts of that piece of property, what's important to the landowner and try and tailor that easement uh, to meet those needs. And, and an easement is placed on a, on a piece of private property where the owner can remain there. You can buy it, you can sell it, you can buy a piece with an easement. Um, what happens is that we end up being a partner in that property with whoever owns that piece of property. So if we've got certain uses or restrictions, the land trust is there to come back year after year after year in perpetuity to make sure that, that those uh, portions of the easement are, are being upheld and work with that landowner. As things change, as times change, we may need to adjust an easement here or there or, or make a, um, a decision on a use. And somebody will be in my position for perpetuity. And I, I make sure that I keep my easements up to date so the next executive director can understand what's going on. And as uh, individuals buy and sell pieces of property, we work with those new landowners who come in to make sure that they understand uh, the restrictions and the uses that they may have on their property. So um, my biggest point with that is that every easement we hold is different. Um, we work to be very flexible, uh, to find a way to promote a conservation ethic of a landowner while keeping that piece of property's conservation values at heart. 
um, we're not necessarily in the preservation business. Um, we're in the conservation business. And my best analogy for that is if you want to preserve a house from 1900, it needs to stay exactly like that, which means you were not going to update the electrical system and you won't put Wi-Fi in it. But if you're going to conserve the house, you may conserve the look of the property, but put new windows in. And with a conservation easement versus preservation like a national park, we understand that, that best management practices are going to move over time. These are private properties, uh, but we can conserve a certain amount of it to, to preserve that look of a corridor or um, work with uh, making sure that habitat stays in place while we still um, allow for farming, ranching, um, or it could be public access. We might be able to, to uh, bring public access to a piece of property and, and have that there in perpetuity, but it doesn't always the case. So they're just flexible um, in the building of them, but once we build an easement, then it becomes a legal document and it'll stand over time. Um, People often ask what land qualifies for an easement. You heard me talk about some of those. I mean, it's forests, wetlands, farms, ranches, wildlife ha habitats, scenic areas, his historic areas. If there's a heavy conservation component to it, so the land hasn't been um, you know, converted in, in, too far into um, you know, a, a subdivision where there's only 20 acres left out of you know, 2000, uh, you know, we want to talk to people. We like to see acreages in that 10 to 20 to 40 and on up, finding ways to, to conserve those properties and then link those properties together. Um, we often get asked, why would you want to grant a conservation easement? Well, we're at a point in Idaho where, where the landowners right now ha definitely have an opportunity to um, set the stage for what our area will look like in the next 50 to 100 years. So as a property owner, there's some management and responsibilities that go with that ownership. And if you would like to see it stay open, like to see your, your property have some uh, ag production value or wildlife value, water quality value, um, now's the time to, to exercise your private property right and put an easement in and we'll work to find a way to to carry forward your conservation ethic. Now that value comes in the form of, uh, you know, giving up future use. So there's a monetary value that comes with giving up future use. And if you're not gonna put houses on it, you've given up that um, value. The IRS does recognize a, a certain amount of that value that can come in a tax saving as a charitable contribution. So we're able to help offset some of the loss in value through a savings and tax. Um, and at certain times, you may not, if you're a property owner, you may not be able to fully give away uh, through a charitable contribution that whole value. And so we can work to fund part of that easement value back to you if it provides a service to the folks who wanna fund it. So it might be a public access portion and there will be the ability to raise funds to allow the public to come through your property. So it all depends on what you're wanting to do, but there, uh, there are definitely some benefits to a conservation easement and you're helping to shape our, our uh, community. Um, and these are some of the pictures of some of the properties that we have easements on. Um, and, and you can see we work in a wide range and a diverse landscape. We work in four counties. So not just Valley County, but Adams, Washington, and Idaho. So there's there's three, you know, river systems that we work with. The, the Payette River Basin um, is one that's right in our back door, but it's also the Weezer River and the Little Salmon Salmon that we work in. And so uh, the benefits to these landowners go across the scale, not just here in McCall, but this whole West Central area. And um, one of those examples that I can show right here in the area is the Black Hawk Conservation easements. These went in in the mid 2000s and it's a good example of how you can balance conservation and development. So as they went in to, to plan out the Black Hawk development, the Pay Land Trust worked with them to conserve these, these areas which uh, amount to 364 acres of wetlands um, along the uh, west side of the Payette River. And uh, 
they gave up some some developable places to make sure that we had this corridor in place. So um, we're benefiting, the whole community is benefiting from the added water quality that comes in conserving wetland areas. This is a huge area for wetland birds, migratory birds, um, moose, deer, elk, bear, all kinds of critters running up and down there. And we know now that we've got this um, 364 acre corridor conserved. Um, now that is one piece of the, the puzzle. Pay It Land Trust really looks at this whole area as a basin watershed. So we can go out and, and conserve little pieces here and there. We've got 10 easements and two fee title properties. But as Idaho is growing, we realized that we needed a more focused approach. And one of the things we wanted to look at was a basin wide approach. So we started looking at where can we affect the Payette River Basin, not just for us, but downstream users as well. And so in 2018, we uh, kind of unveiled our Payette River Basin initiative. And, and the goal of that initiative is to create a connected corridor from the inlet of Payette Lake all the way down to the Cabarton Bridge the best that we can. So you see that in yellow. That's a half mile off of the high water mark. What we want to do is talk to talk to landowners, whoever those landowners are within that yellow area, and see if we can help uh, conserve that river corridor, both from um, you know an access uh, and from a water quality wildlife habitat um, perspective. And so that's a pretty big project. And we broke it into three project areas. We had the Payette Lake Conservation Project area, which focuses around the Payette Lake, and that's the endowment lands, but it also includes a, a, a few private property owners in that area as well. And then we looked at the Payette River Access Project area. So what we started to see is that um, traditional uses along the Payette River were starting to disappear, as we all know, as more people move in, more areas get developed, uh, the less apt folks are to let you walk through their backyard to put your canoe in, in, in the Payot River. So we wanted to start making sure that there were places that people could access the Payot River for fishing, boating, and at the same time, protect that water quality in, in the wildlife corridor. So we've got this Payot River access project. And then something that's, that's also very important is the Ag Heritage Project. And that is because a lot of the open space that we have right now, especially in the valley floor, is private ownership. And a large segment of that is still in ag production. So um, how do we keep those folks um, viable in this area? Ag is usually the point where we see the most conversion uh, to development. And again, Payet Land Trust is not anti-development. We are balanced development. So there's some places that we feel are, are okay for development. There's other places we'd rather not see that happen and this corridor is one of them. And so if we can help uh, keep those ag folks connected up and productive, then that open space stays there and there's a lot of wildlife benefit that comes with that. So a little more specific on the ground project, this is the uh, Nahas Ranch. We've got an easement on it. And uh, you're looking at the West Mountains there. So. Um, this is right within that uh, Payette River corridor. It's on the east side, um, just west of Lake Fork. Um, the Payette River acquisition uh, project, we've got one piece, as you can see, it's in the red, 44 acres south of the McCall, about four miles. It's within the Payette River subdivision uh, properties off of Moon Ridge. It was slated to be uh, a 38 home site back in 1992. And for a lot of reasons, we won't go into it. It just never happened. And we had the opportunity to start to conserve this. We found two conservation buyers who purchased that property and gave us a, a year to conserve it. And they're willing to put conservation easements on it, take that tax deduction and then sell it at a discounted rate uh, for public access. So we're in the midst of that raising, fundraising 350,000 to, to make this 44 acre piece accessible for the public. And we're about halfway there. So we've seen a great response to that. And then um, we've been involved in, in uh, some of the uh, work around the Payette Lake with IDL. We've been working with 
on this project for probably uh, two and a half years. And our main focus was trying to figure out a way to permanently conserve as much as, of the lake as we could uh, that was undeveloped. Um, the working with IDL and, and endowment land is interesting and complex because it's kind of a, a hybrid version of public uh, lands and private lands. So endowment was set in, in place really to fund the, some of the public services. So education, there's um, a list of beneficiaries that they, they are beholden to and have some fiduciary duties. Uh, a lot of us around this area, um, you know, came here and felt like, oh, what, what a great state park that's around um, Payette Lake. And in reality, it's not, you know, it's, it's not public land like Ponderosa is public land. It's a different beast. And so we've been working with IDEA to try and figure out if there's a, you know, a way for us to be involved in conservation. And the route that we took was applying for conservation easements. Um, Eastside Drive has been an area that we've been working on uh, for quite some time. And, and that's this parcel H and parcel G uh, portion of, of IDL's property. And I told Nicole that I would keep all of this down to a half an hour and we'd use the last half hour for questions and answers. So we're right at 4.30. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can all see each other and sort of um, turn it back to Nicole. And um, I think she might've had some questions for me that we'd start with and then we'd, we'd venture from there. Yeah, that was, uh, that was great to understand the ins and outs of how the Pay at Land Trust works, but it really kind of opened my eyes to how many moving parts there are in our community to, to bring all of that together. Have, have all of these parts equaled a shared vision or a community plan? Um, you were mentioning, you know, setting the stage for the future. And so has that, has that happened? So I think what, what you're referring to are some of the uh, issues with the endowment and, and what do they want to see happen. I mean, that's been on the uh, radar for a lot of folks. Um, over the past year, there was a focus group, uh, IDL called it PELS, the Pay it, uh, Endowment Land Strategy Plan. Uh, and there were a lot of different groups that were involved in talking about what they feel should happen with the land that IDL and, and the land board control around the lake. And, and I would say that what has come out of everybody that's been involved with this, and there's been a lot of, a lot of folks, um, has been the, the desire to see some form of conservation come. Uh, the, the, the scared part that everybody worries about is that seeing that land divided up into different sections and sold off and losing that connectivity, losing the access, uh, losing the water quality benefits that exist there now. And coming together with a, with a plan like um, that would involve all the entities that have interest in that is, is, is very difficult because uh, everybody has their own uh, idea, uh, ideology and focus. So from our standpoint with the Pay at Land Trust, we've, we've met with multiple people um, again, we work with the, with the private landowners and in a way, the, um, the endowment has the same aspects of, of, of private landowners. Uh, there's, my, my best scenario is it's a, it's, a, it's a ranch that was given by mom and dad to the grandkids and none of the grandkids live there anymore and they're trying to figure out what to do with it. Um, but they're but they're beholden to a, a certain set of needs, and so we started to uh, look at it from that standpoint. And, and how can we be involved as a pay at land trust? Easements were what we do, so we wanted to offer up easements to the endowment uh, folks, and we, we'd like to see it stay as much um, public access as we possibly can. So that's part of what our easements would involve. We'd like to see timber and grazing still exist out there, but at the same time, I think we're moving away economically in this area from those as the drivers. And it has to be opened up to public access and the recreation that has really built McCall, uh, partially is built around uh, the, these lands that are around the lake. And so access to the lake is huge. 
uh, we don't have that much access left if you really look at it. Um, I think uh, we're down to just a few miles of, of shoreline that you can walk down to um, that hasn't already been impacted, it doesn't have a road on it or, or a house. Now there's a lot of other groups that have a lot of other ideas. So bringing people together uh, is a tricky business. And, and we, we're meeting and trying to figure that out, looking for direction from the land board and, and from IDL. So it's an ongoing process. Yep. It sounds like it. And it sounds like there's a lot of individuals and groups that are involved and um, bringing people together can be, can be a challenge. Although I think everyone does, you know, have a, a, a clear understanding that this place is special. And so what do you think would be some of the parameters or guardrails or some of the reality versus expectation that could be expected when a group like this gets together to try and move forward with a shared vision? So I think one of the biggest um, bookends, so to speak, has, has been understanding what the endowment is, how it was built and the re requirements that they have back to their duties as public officials. So the land board is, you know, uh, staffed by the governor, attorney general, uh, controller, the um, uh, secretary of education and the secretary of state. So they, they're beholden to their constitutional fiduciary duties to supply funding to, and long-term perpetual funding to a group of beneficiaries. So understanding that is one of the most important things before we bring any ideas to the table, because if they won't fulfill the uh, funding requirements of the land board, then they're not going to really listen to what kind of proposals you have. Now, we're talking about this in perpetuity and over time. So it doesn't necessarily have to be done all at once. It, it can provide opportunities for fiscal responsibility over time. And understanding those parameters are key before we move forward on trying to come up with, whether it's a plan from the Payette Land Trust or a plan from the McCall community, uh, we have to understand that whatever that is, how do they fit together and how do they meet the requirements uh, because the AG pretty much set it out straight in November. He said, we've got a constitutional fiduciary duty that we have to meet first and foremost before we look at any of the other side parameters. So if we're going to present a plan, we have to know that it's going to meet the needs of uh, the land board. Great. Well, I think that that uh, probably sums up everything, uh, the majority of the questions that we um, prepared. So we can open it up to Q&A now. If anybody would like to ask any questions of Craig, Nat, just raise your hand and I will let you go. How do you raise your hand? <laughs> well, you can go like this. Unless you, I don't think the hand raise thing is on. John, did you have a question? What are the driving factors with the land with the uh, land board? What are the compelling objectives that they have to meet? Well, I don't want to speak directly for the land board, but I think what I've come to understand it over the last few years, John, is that um, over over the years, primarily uh, endowment has been focused on you know the commodity returns that come off their property. So it's either been timber grazing, mining, things like that. that and, and in most cases, they've been happy with their return on their investments over time. The question that comes into play around Payette Lake and, and specifically the 5,000 acres that falls in under the um, McCall impact zone is that development uh, pressures around those areas have increased those uh, values of the actual property beyond what the commodity can return. So then it's up to the land board to decide what they want to do. Do they want to um, increase the value of that property through something besides the commodity that they've been using, in this case, timber? Uh, so timber values aren't meeting the development value of that property. And how do they then turn that value into cash, which goes into a fund that pays the beneficiaries? So the, the factors that I, I believe that are affecting 
the 5,000 acres around the lake are the increasing development pressure to build on lakeshore and within the vicinity and within the viewshed of the lake. And we have to try and figure out how do you balance that? If you wanna keep this open and connected um, and as it is now, there are a lot of environmental values that are there that we have to figure out how to turn into the, the cash that, that the endowment needs and that they feel they're required to return to their beneficiaries. And this isn't just now, but it's over time. So they have to make those decisions that um, haven't necessarily been presented to them before. So as we see more development in this area, as that development is concentrated um, towards the high value um, lake properties, we're gonna see that pressure increase. And not just here, but Coeur d'Alene, um, anywhere that has these kind of uh, endowment lands up against a water body where people wanna live, they're gonna have to make these same kind of decisions. That's why we, we've been proposing easements. So we come in and you put an easement that's non-development and we would have to pay for that easement on market value. It'd be appraised. They have a system for appraising things um, like this. They do it with the Forest Legacy Project. Up north is where that one's been used the most, but it, they have a plan to come up with what the value of those easements would be. And then it's up to the Pale Land Trust to figure out how to raise those funds. And that would be a community you know, involvement, whether it's private donations, grants, what have you. Um, so that's where we are with that. I don't know if that fully answers your question, John, um, but that's my thank you. understanding. Thank you, for, thank you for the comment. The, the thing that I perceive uh, is that the land board is compelled to fund education in the state of Idaho under the constitution. Mm -hmm. And so they've, they've really got, uh, they can't play a long-term developer role uh, and their options are constrained. And the, it seems to me our, the strategy, our strategy ought to be uh, to react promptly to the pressure that is gonna move them to do transactions rather than to play the role of a patient developer. I, I don't think under the constitution they can play patient developer. Right. And, and I think that's what we're, we're looking at John is trying to figure out how to how to meet their needs uh, in the short term as well as as uh, the long term. With thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Craig, I had a question come in, and it's uh, it's it's a good one. And it's is there a successful land trust or conservation model you've seen elsewhere that the community could look to for inspiration? Well, um, I'll say this with a caveat on on McCall and the endowment and any easement that we do is again, they are all individuals. They all have their own complex uh, issues and, and needs for solutions. But um, in our own state, you can, you can look to the Boise foothills as a way to say, here's an area that is up for development, but we would like to see it stay open and in a conservation how do we figure out how to come together to solve that problem? And so that was successful in Boise. Different players, different issues, but in the end, the same ideology is that how, how do we conserve this area? Uh, you can see it up in Whitefish. There's some places in Montana. Um, so there are, there, there are models out there. What we always caution is that the, the endowment throws a sticky wicket into it, so to speak, um, that may not exist in one of the other scenarios. So it's not gonna be a cut and paste, but I think the idea of, of communities coming together, uh, forming coalitions and finding ways to come up with master plans uh, to meet that end goal of conservation are, are definitely available, so. Great. Anyone else? Go ahead, Kristen. Craig, you talk about um, the conservation easements that you've uh, proposed on G and H. Was there a reason you didn't also go after the islands that are part of the drinking water issue? Is that just because it was too big or can you comment on that? Yeah, I can comment on that. So um, the so what Kristen is, is talking about is that um, 
We we submitted an app. We as the Pay Land Trust submitted an application to uh, Idaho Department of Lands for non-development conservation easements on parcel G and H. And again, those are the East Side Drive. And really, Kristen, it was we'd been working with folks on East Side Drive um, for quite some time. Uh, we had in our mind the ability to come up with with easement language and a plan for East Side Drive. Um, and when it came to the to the decision point of moving forward, we also had folks that showed up and said, if you're able to get easements on East Side Drive, we'll fund the fundraising to purchase those. And to be honest, we haven't been approached in that same manner on any of the other parcels. The other thing is that that uh, the core question still remains on the easements that we have submitted, and that is, does IDL and the land board want to go down that road? Uh, we've heard there's no legal impediment to for them placing an easement, it's the desire. And we're waiting to hear back on that desire if, if the land board wants to go that route. Now, the, at the last March board meeting, uh, the governor put it pretty plainly to IDL to come up with a protocol for conservation easements. So we feel like there is um, strong support for that. Now coming up with a protocol and, and actually following through on that are two different things, but, it, but at least we know that that is out there. It's a question that's being addressed. And as we all know, the Idaho legislature got a little crazy and a little long. And so I think that has taken up some of the time between the last comments that we heard from the, the governor and the AG uh, to now. There's been a lot of other big issues in the state. And while this is a huge issue to us, it, it may not be the top of the top of the list when it comes to what the AG had to work on. And so um, we met with with most of the land board members in April. Uh, April 1st, actually, and, and they said, give us some time to work through some of this. And so um, we did, and we're starting to go back and ask those questions. And but really circling back around, Kristen, to your point is that um, we'd be willing to put applications on, on other easements if we knew that there, the funding was there and that there was a solid plan on, on why are we wanting to conserve this piece. So we had that on, on G and H from the years we've been working on it. So thank you. Yep. Hi, right, Craig, this is Ron. I wanted to ask a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Got you okay. loud and clear, Ron. Um, first, let me say, I think the funds would be available on, for a conservation easement on Cougar Island. I think there are, a lot of people on the West Shore that would be willing to support that, including my wife and I. Um, and I'm hopeful. The challenge on Cougar Island I see is that the land board has a very unrealistic valuation on those parcels, um, which is gonna make it difficult. And I don't know how we un unwind that or approach them with regard, with regard to that valuation. My question is that the land board has been harvesting some very large gains um, in Valley County over the last four or five years through the sale of their cottage lots, uh, which came up, which came about subsequent to their, the settlement that they had with the, with the uh, Payette Lakes Cottage Sites Association. And uh, my understanding is they're sitting now on a very large surplus. Um, and I'm wondering, does that, uh, does that play at all into the time scales that uh, we may have available to us to work something out with them? Um, you know, clearly uh, they, they've had a, a huge rush of revenue over a short period of time from, from this area. And it seems to me that um, that should have something to do with the time scale that they give us to work out a solution to these other issues. That's a, that's a good point, Ron. And it's been brought up in other discussions about um, what is the, you know, what is the need for return when when you're a when you're a entity in perpetuity, so the the land board is an entity in perpetuity. Do you have to look at an ultimate return for just one year, or do you draw that out over time? And th and that's been used uh, as a justification for timber ground because you don't harvest timber ground every year. It's got a fifty year, a hundred year uh, 
you know, return on your crop. So you, you, you have to say, well, I'm going to hold this property until the next crop comes around because I know it's going to grow and I know I can sell timber on it. So the question then is, do you treat the each individual parcel or each individual acre on its own onus? What can it return or do you treat it uh, as an area as, as you're talking about? And, and we haven't got a, a great straight answer back from the land board to tell you the truth on that, Ron. Um, and I think because they haven't been asked that question in that way, there's a lot of new firsts for the, for the land board and, and IDL in trying to deal with this issue of, of uh, increased development value on land around the lake. Uh, but it's, it's a point that you bring up and some others have brought up as well, um, that is there really a, a need to do something right now? I wish I could answer that question for you, but I can't. I, I'm a new, a real newcomer to this, uh, to this whole process. And I thank you very much for explaining the difference to me between conservation and preservation. I think that's, that's a valuable thing for those of us in the community to understand. And um, one of the things that came to mind when you were talking about all the disparate groups and individuals that are interested in this and coming together and trying to um, trying to come up with some solutions. How how organized are they? Have they chosen some leaders, uh, or, or are they leaning on you to to be the the leader of that initiative to 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 save our area? Um, is there some uh, organization in the process? Um, so during the the last eight months, when IDL had. Um, turned out their plan, the Pell's plan, again, the, the, the pay it endowment uh, land strategy, they asked um, interested parties, that, that they invited interested parties uh, to become part of a focus group to talk about what we thought we wanted to see in this area. And, and with that group, uh, we met four or five times um, in an official capacity with IDL and discussed the the lands around the lake and the parcels that they had and what they wanted to see happen, IDL wanted to see happen. Out of that, um, that focus group continued to, to meet both individually and kind of collectively in a loose coalition. Um, we talked back and forth about um, what each group is looking at. And so I can use the Pay Land Trust as an example. So we're mainly involved in, in um, the idea of conservation easements. But a group like Simba, um, Central Mountain Bike, Central Idaho Mountain Bike Association is really looking at public access and, and trail building. So when, when I'm thinking of an easement for the Pay at Land Trust, we wanna to talk to Simba and say, are you guys wanting to have access on the east side? And what do you think that would look like? And can we make sure that an easement is written in a way that allows for a lease with IDL uh, that allows them to continue to do what they're doing. And so we've had those conversations both individually and as a collective group, there's probably, I would say 20 individual entities or people that have shown interest. Would I say that we have a, a strong one coalition that's leading the charge? I don't, I wouldn't say that we're there yet, but there's a lot of groups that spend a lot of time, you know, making sure that we all know what each individual organization is doing. Uh, we did receive from the governor some pretty strong feedback that says uh, get get those groups together and and come to us with an organization that mm -hmm. can that can lay a plan like the Boise foothills in front of the, the land board. So, um, you know, I, I think that has been um, discussed. I wouldn't say that we're there yet, for sure, but it's a good question. Thanks, Joan. Okay, thank you. And I think, uh, you know, we're getting close to the five o'clock hour. So I, I also want to round this out a little bit away from just the Payette Lake Conservation Project area in that the, the land trust uh, really does take this, uh, not, not just what the issues we're talking around Payette Lake, but, but the whole corridor, the whole basin is very important to our area. And we want to make sure that when we do talk about conservation, that we're including the whole Payette River Basin. Uh, and so that is all the way down into Cascade 
And, and this is a model that we would like to replicate on the Weezer River and, and the Salmon, Little Salmon area. So it, it, it just goes to show you how con uh, complicated conservation can be, especially in the private land world, because we'll deal with a lot of individual private landowners to try and make a connected corridor happen. Um, and this is just one part of it, the, the Payette Lake Conservation Project and, and working with the endowment. And it's not just the endowment around the lake, there are private individuals that we're working with as well to try and conserve their properties. But it goes on down the river as we see development happening along the river, people wanna be next to that water, so how do we do that? And then there's Cascade Lake, there's issues down there as well. So uh, I wanted to kind of broaden it out. We got very specific around endowment issues in Payette Lake to broaden it back out that there's, there's a, a need for um, a larger vision within our, our corridor. And whether Boise knows it or not, they should be really happy we're thinking about water quality <laughs> because they're the downstream water users. We're at the top of the watershed. And, and it's not just Boise, it's, it's anybody in Seattle and Portland because all of our water ends up in the Columbia. And, and if we start having issues, it'll exacerbate their issues as well. So I think we've got some steward responsibilities as citizens and organizations at the top of the watershed to make sure that we're looking out for what happens downstream, whether they know they need it or not. Um, and we've seen this in, a, in other communities. Um, so uh, the, the one thing uh, that I do want to share real quick with everybody is that um, I'll throw this up on the screen here is that coming up on June 19th, the weekend of 19th and 20th is the longest daylight of the year. Uh, so you need to get out and celebrate conservation over that weekend. Go, go ride a bike, go hike, fish, swim, whatever you do. But while, well, while you're thinking about getting outside on that weekend, come to the activity barn and join us for our, our annual barbecue. We're gonna be roasting a pig down there. So uh, we get a, smoke, a roaster from the smoke jumpers that I'll roll out during the farmer's market. And uh, I got a 180 pound hog that we're gonna put on it and do a big pig roast and kind of celebrate conservation. So wanna make sure that everybody comes out for that and, and joins us. Um, and I just wanted to thank Ponderosa uh, for Ponderosa Center for providing this platform and giving us an opportunity to talk about conservation. Uh, in this picture here, these are the places that we've conserved uh, over the years, everywhere from, from uh, the Salmon River uh, over to Riggins, down into Cambridge and, and right here in our own backyard. Um, so I wanna, wanna thank those folks for giving us the opportunity. Um, and we, we do have a few minutes less left. If anybody else has a question, I'm more than willing to stick around and talk, but um, that hour flew by pretty fast. It, that hour does go by really fast, Craig. Uh, the Payette Land Trust is obviously a very vital, vibrant, well-run organization. And we're very lucky to have you in our community and to have shared all of that great information with us. Um, so Craig Utter, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of the Ponderosa Center and Ponderosa Center Presents, we're very glad to have all of you here and uh, have participated with us. So this is the end of our virtual season. Uh, we've been running this series with many different topics um, since January. And so now it's time to move it outside. Um, summer concert series will begin in July and go through August every Tuesday, Tuesday at the Terrace a free community concert. So we hope you'll all join us there. Come out and have a good time together. Um, but for now, that's it. And so thank you for joining us and we'll see you soon. Thank you guys, appreciate it. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions.